Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm, I'm going to count on uh, some call and response here. So you are, you are now on notice um, that I will periodically ask your views on some of the things that I raise. I want to thank John Wyant for his generous introduction and for his tutelage for the years that I was at Stanford as a PhD candidate in the EIPER program. And I see so many friends here. It is a real privilege, indeed a great honor, to be returning and contributing to this energy seminar series. I have seen some of the other seminar series on iTunes, and I have already seen the syllabus of speakers you'll be hearing from the rest of this quarter. It's star-studded and makes me feel like I really need to earn my keep in the next half hour, 45 minutes or so. So I'll try my best, and you can give me all types of feedback, either you know, en route or on the way to the reception. So I'll look forward to uh, that exchange. Because John mentioned that the abstract for my remarks today may have seemed, I'm not sure, he said complicated. No. Let, let me give it another chance. My view is that the science and technology training that supports energy engineers at Stanford and many other universities can be complemented by other ways of understanding how energy policy decisions are taken when values are at stake. And Sally Benson explicitly asked me to speak to equity as one factor that would expand the decision frame in a conversation that's about energy technology transitions in our time. And so my efforts this afternoon with you will be to offer three calls to action that I think are undeniable. They have to be answered. And then to look at a couple of different competing frameworks for concepts of justice and fairness that are playing out in the combat zones where consequential decisions are being taken by extremely hardworking people that I think aren't appreciated in a broad public that sees Washington, DC, perhaps in a state of ineptitude. <laughs> but I want to describe to you some of the dimensions of the challenges that uh, make the decisions that need to be taken difficult to take, and then illustrate that with two sets of remarks, one about the American South and the attention to the American South as an important element of the American energy technology transition story. And finally, a vignette of sorts about how a mere pedestrian graduate from Stanford could arrive at the Department of Energy and stumble upon an opportunity to address equity issues that would actually unlock a large amount of opportunity for a lot of people in many places for a long time. So how does that sound as a tour de force of the next few minutes? Terrific, terrific. I've been told there's a clicker tricker. This graph here shows you a very strong directional vector in the northeast direction. It basically describes to you a reflection of modern history that has a strong correlation between energy demand and prosperity as it's reflected in per capita GDP. My point to you this afternoon is that these lines don't go southwest or southeast very easily. That means that there is an energy demand imperative for policymakers in nations around the world that seek affordable supplies of energy to power the economies that deliver opportunities for prosperity to people that support their leadership. How many people here would recognize the calls and the claims for access to modern electricity as one of the calls of our time? How many people here would, would imagine that they themselves might, in the course of their career, work on answering this kind of call? It's a good number of hands. So I, myself, in 1998, was in South Africa responding to a very interesting moment in time when the African National Congress had come to power and there were large tracts of land that had been systematically denied access to electricity. And it turned out that renewable energy was the most cost effective way to serve the load in some of those areas. I learned a tremendous amount. I'm deeply humbled and 
thankful to the people that I met through that experience. And I'm also thankful that the work continues today in enterprises and initiatives like the one that Secretary Stephen Chu joined the World Bank and the United Nations to launch called Sustainable Energy for All. So those of you who are still interested in answering this call to action now have a much more robust structure and platform for engagement. If you haven't heard of Sustainable Energy for All and you're looking for a way to plug in, this is uh, an already ready-made current of activity for you to join. No matter what, I think this is a persistent call to action. But it's not the only one in our energy space, so let me try another one. Who recognizes this guy? <laughs> so George W. Bush was not the first person to try to communicate to the American people about what he called, quote, a serious problem. But he was probably the most succinct by describing to Americans a pattern of consumption that appeared very close to be, being an addiction. He told America in the 2006 State of the Union address, America is addicted to oil, which is often imported from unstable parts of the world. He was not the first president to say something like that. And John Stewart mocked the commanders in chief who had successfully said something similar over a period of 20 years in a very irreverent monologue. What I want to point out is that another Stanford graduate, Jim Woolsey, uh, had in his career as CIA director been privy to more information than most. And as he toured the country after his period of service, he emphasized the need to reduce the strategic importance of oil. He wasn't, he wasn't calling for the elimination of oil from America's transportation fuel mix. He was saying reduce its strategic significance because there's so much tension on the supply chains for the American economy. Now, this is the supply chain of energy for the American economy. It's published every year by Lawrence Livermore Lab. And on the left-hand side, you see all of our primary energy resources and the flows that lead to the end use sectors on the right hand side. For our purposes today, I'm only interested in the transportation sector because of its alignment with our dependence on liquid fuels. And so let me blow that up for you. This little orange line here is four orders of magnitude smaller than the prevailing source of fuel for America's transportation sector. So this is an enormous opportunity for people who are looking at options and opportunities to add some flexibility to the system. How many people here think that they might be involved in research or work in policy or commerce that would be answering this as a call of our time? I got a good number, a good number of hands. Good, a good number of hands. I myself, in 1995, left school and joined a solar car race team because I was convinced at the time that we had the technologies available off the shelf to make an aerodynamic, lightweight vehicle that ran on electricity powered by the sun at 60 miles an hour with little more than the energy needed for a toaster oven. And we actually, with this ex experimental vehicle, did demonstrate that that was true. But so did 40 other colleges, including Stanford University. And I'm so pleased that I had the opportunity then to meet some Stanford students who were on the Stanford solar car team in 1995. They are now hardworking executives at Tesla Motors, <laughs> putting some of those technology lessons right to work in a way that is revolutionizing what we think of as possible in the 21st century transportation story. But there's something else on this diagram that I think can't be ignored, and it's all this underutilized energy on the right-hand side. And so I want to give credit to other Stanford alums and current students and faculty who have worked on the resource efficiency side of the transportation sector, looking in this case at the example of the hypercar where Michael Brylowski had worked for more than a decade on this concept car. And now this year we see it uh, in some of its attributes in the Volkswagen XL1. So both the efficiency and the electricity side give us some ideas about flexibility that we might have in relaxing the dependence on oil. That's a second call to action I think that we can't ignore in the 21st century. You will not be surprised by the third. So of course in the last 18 months we have received the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's assessment of the science followed by a very extensive 
review by the United States government, the federal government's United States National Climate Assessment. And even this summer, a product that had all types of participation from Stanford and the Hoover Institute, risky business, looking at the impacts on the American economy of climate change, climate changes unabated. How many people here would recognize this as one of the calls of our time? Oh my goodness, <laughs> by far the most popular. But imagine for a minute solving this problem and leaving the other two unaddressed. Can you imagine it? I'm seeing shaking heads. How many people believe that we might be able to take care of this problem and just ignore the other two? Yeah, and so there's an integrated problem solving imperative in the calls of our time, which I'm trying to draw to attention. When I was a graduate student in the interdisciplinary program on environment and resources, I had the good counsel of John Cumey and John Wyatt, uh, the late Stephen Schneider and others, who helped me look at a massive amount of literature that had been produced by modelers exploring the question, what technology portfolios in the energy sector might be able to support us on a path to climate stabilization? This is an example of that work that shows an incredibly aggressive arc down to zero and into this negative emission zone in the latter part of the century. But a very modest contribution from solar and wind. If I hadn't learned from the faculty here how to decompose these scenarios to understand the underlying assumptions and their implications, I wouldn't have known whether or not I wanted to accept the findings of this research or instead interrogate its assumptions. This is the work of scholarship at Stanford in looking at some of the policy analysis that may arrive at the doorstep of decision makers who are trying to chart a course towards a climate stable future. When I was one of those people as the senior policy advisor in the Office of Policy and International Affairs at the Department of Energy, I received a briefing that was offered every two years to the senior leadership of every Department of Energy in every industrialized nation on Earth. And it was accompanying the release of the Energy Technologies Perspectives Report that is published by the International Energy Agency, which is essentially a wing of a national security uh, organization, OECD, organized in some ways in opposition to OPEC in order to contend with supply concerns for the global oil trade. This report in 2012 did not mince its words on a key finding. Energy related CO2 emissions need to be completely eliminated in order to limit greenhouse gas driven global warming to two degrees. The words completely eliminated by 2075 wasn't totally surprising to me because of course I had been looking at these models earlier but it really gave a new sense of urgency to the decisions that we were taking within one infrastructure life cycle of that kind of time frame. Now, they did not add a red blur down here at the zero line, but I did, because I think it's honest for audiences particularly like this to point out that there's a large amount of uncertainty that bounds such a number. But nevertheless, they weren't talking about something after 2100. The International Energy Agency was briefing the senior leadership of every energy department in every industrialized nation that get a move on it. So how many people might have asked themselves, do you think we can do it? Do you think it's still possible? Oh, I see a lot of hands. Well, those are extremely compelling and demanding intellectual questions for inquiry in the academy and in government agencies like the Department of Energy. And the good news is that since Florentine Krauss and John Cumey first published a bat casting scenario almost 20 years ago telling us that it was possible, others have validated that work through the Energy Modeling Forum led by John Wyatt. And our own Mark Jacobson here at Stanford has even gone further to give us scenarios that describe 100% clean energy futures at even earlier dates. But there's a number of different methodologies that one could apply to try to answer these questions. Sally Benson, who's not with us today, was the convening lead author for a part of the global energy assessment, which really looked at emerging economies and the challenges and opportunities they face. And this summer, Stanford graduates who work with a successful consulting firm in San Francisco called E3 participated with Jeffrey Sachs, who's known for his work on energy development. Remember, call to action number one. 
to let us know that they too found that deep decarbonization scenarios were indeed technically feasible, even if challenging. That could give us hope, but it doesn't give us very much time. So what I have opened with are three calls of our time that I will summarize as the need for energy sufficiency, energy security, and sustainability. You may find your own language for them. But I haven't seen with the body language and waving hands in this audience that you're a group of people that's willing to drop kick any one of them. In which case, we have to find a way to take responsibility for responding to these calls in a, on a scale that matters and a time frame that makes a difference. And that was a strong theme for my remarks today. So having introduced three calls to action, I'd like to move to the grounds for policy engagement, the vignette about the American South, and about my experience in the Department of Energy looking for ways to address equity in ways that will unlock the opportunity for more investment and acceleration. One of the things that I appreciated about my experience at Stanford was the rigor with which microeconomics was offered to every level of study in my experience. And I learned that the United States would value clean energy technology solutions as long as we could buy it at a price that we could afford for its purposes. And we would buy it from whoever would produce it, having invested in its production to realize competitive returns, even if they were outside the United States. And those that would invest in the production of the solutions that we needed would only do so if they also had sound conditions for market development. Germany provided that to its producers, and they had first mover's advantage for at least a decade. China moved in very strongly and gave some of their producers a lot of support, and it challenged us. When I arrived at the Department of Energy, I arrived with a set of linkages that helped me understand that rules make market conditions worth investing in. And if you don't have the investments, then don't expect the technology deployment on the scale that you wanted to achieve the, ob the objective that you were aiming for. And if you run that in reverse, if you want a lot of clean energy and fast, you need to have investment conditions that are sustained by stable market conditions with rules that are compatible for that policy objective. Easier said than done. So to humble ourselves a moment to the challenge, this is a picture of our past. The story of America's technology transitions in the energy sector dating back to the 1850s, where you see that not one of these major transitional events took less than five decades. And if you are a real enthusiast about renewable energy, how many people are real enthusiasts about clean energy? <laughs> Look at that. All right, have you got your peering glasses on? This is you. <laughs> right here, this little pink dot. Remember what I said earlier about 2075? It's about right there. That's breathtaking, friends. Breathtaking. So if we were to try to navigate the path for a 21st century energy technology transition with that level of speed and scale, you would expect investments in clean energy to be surging here in the opening decades. In the last couple of years, they've been trending in the opposite direction that we would need to see for the pace to pick up. Now, I joined the Department of Energy right here, as did everybody who joined the administration at the beginning of the first term. It was a dark period of the Great Recession. But the effects of the Recovery Act in particular helped us. Some of the policies were, were able to inspire a large amount of investment. In the aftermath, we weren't able to sustain those conditions for the largest amount of asset investment. And we also had other shifting structural changes in the market, including low-cost natural gas. What I want to point out is that there is a widely shared view 
that there's a role for public investments and innovation that help us drive down the cost and therefore increase the competitiveness of clean energy solutions relative to the incumbents, which in the long run can help us speed up the deployment again. So one of my favorite memos published by the Department of Energy was last year posted on the White House website called Revolution Now. And uh, it's, a, it's a, a memo that covers four clean energy technologies and shows how over time the successive achievements in cost reduction led ultimately to a tipping point that allowed the industry to take off with the level of private sector investment that you always hoped you would see. For those of you in the back, on the right hand side that's solar PV, bottom left is LED lights and bottom right is batteries for electric vehicles and mobile storage. Utilitarianism allows us to imagine that we're making public investments that serve the greatest good. Utilitarianism also masks the persistent claims for distributive justice, where there are parties who compete against each other for what they perceive to be a limited amount of available support from public spending. I'm going to leave research and development, where I think I've just argued there's a, a widespread understanding that there are benefits to investments in innovation, and we've seen the results of that over time, and switch to a view that you might also recognize from the aftermath of the Waxman-Markey bill, where parties that were able to project their interests onto a political process literally divvied up a pie. And Congress was unable to come to terms with a bargain that they could accept. And as a result, we didn't get a comprehensive energy and climate policy in the first congressional term of the first term of the administration. Distributive justice and the ability to play in the dialogue there is not a level playing field. Let me put it that way. But I do think that it's important for us to reconcile ourselves to the advantages that industry incumbents have when they are trying to preserve market share during a period in which the public interest would be served by a transition. During that same period, you might find that there are voices that don't even make it to the table at all. And so I want to draw out the concepts of justice that allow difference to be taken into account. This developed by John Rawls at Harvard University, where the difference principle could be considered in what would be a fair outcome. And the reason why I raise this is that the unequal distributions of benefits and burdens can actually mask the experience of people who aren't really able to be heard at the table and aren't taken into account when the rest of the negotiation occurs. We see this most consistently in the realm of environmental justice. How many people here have studied or worked on environmental justice issues? Well, I see a good number. Well, then you may have already been familiar with this 20-year-old executive order that acknowledged at the time and was reaffirmed on the Obama administration as significant that it is possible for us to consistently burden certain groups of people who are vulnerable in a political process in which they don't share the advantages of other competing interests. In 2010, as the Stimulus Act was being implemented, a fairly substantial group of environmental justice activists got together and wrote essentially an open letter, the Environmental Justice and Green Economy Report. I'm raising it here with you just so that you can catch some snippets of the voice that they were offering to the dialogue. Environmental justice approaches to climate change policies are often predicated on these beliefs, they said. If we are to avert calamitous climate change, we cannot continue business as usual. This is a very strong and assertive voice that goes on to link the great transition towards sustainability to the integrity of our democracy and fundamentally link sustainability, justice, and equity. They weren't just offering a challenge to people who were trying to steward resources during the stimulus. They were actually offering good guidance. 
that equitable sharing of this new green wealth must be a part of any definition of sustainability, or we might not arrive at that objective. And they position themselves as members of the front line, canaries in the coal mine, they call themselves, coming from fence line neighborhoods. We, the environmental justice communities, have valuable experience fighting unfair burdens and shaping sustainable and just alternatives. I've quoted their voice here because I'll need to call on it again in a few minutes. But I hope that I've, in this segment, been able to offer a few different competing concepts of justice that present themselves in the dilemmas that policymakers face when trying to figure out how to answer the calls of our time. How many people here might have watched parts of the People's Climate March in New York City a couple weeks ago? I don't know if any of you made the, made the trip. It's a long trip to make for that kind of event. But it's no mistake that the entire march of 400,000 people was led off by a group that was representing the front lines of crisis and the forefront of change. This constituent base here was frankly, my friends, not present during the waxman markey bill negotiation. We didn't see a galvanized political force that we saw in the streets of New York City now four years later. I think this is a very interesting development and draws climate justice into the dialogue about climate action, explicitly bringing fairness into the context of decision making for policymakers going forward. And even here in California, the distribution of carbon revenues with SB 535, you have an explicit conversation about the allocation of resources to disadvantaged communities in order to make sure that fairness is addressed as part of the solution. Now, I was in New York City. And there weren't that many people from the South in attendance. <coughs> I'm from the South. My family's lived in North Carolina for 250 years. And one thing that I regretted when I was in Washington, DC, in my post at the Department of Energy, and even when I was bearing witness to the climate march in New York City, was that the experience in the American South, I think, is not well understood as an important ingredient in understanding American energy climate politics and the technology transition of the challenges it faces. So I want to spend the next couple of minutes just talking about the American South. First of all, this is a data set that is not likely to change. In other words, it's a robust recording of the frequency with which southern states are hit with billion dollar damages. 30 years of data is not likely to swing around and change and suddenly hit Washington state with a bunch of hurricanes and floods and droughts, right? So this is a picture that would perhaps suggest that southern states would be more motivated than almost anybody else to do something about climate impacts affecting the region. But this is acute pain. This is a picture that describes acute pain and not chronic pain. Let me show you now another map that has a stronger explanatory uh, power for where the South is on energy and climate change. This is a picture that shows the share of household income consumed by electricity where the top 10 states ranked by this metric are all below the Mason-Dixon line. This is chronic pain, not acute pain. And the difference in the metric between Mississippi and Alabama, which are tied for first for the states in the continental United States, let me acknowledge Hawaii out here has even uh, a higher metric. Uh, this is Colorado. The national narrative that there are wealthy, affluent people in a faraway mountainous region that want you to go solar at an expense you can't afford is a very compelling way to destroy the confidence of people who might be organized to support a clean energy transition. And the equity claims haven't really been addressed. So I want to show you a few more maps that help bring that into focus. This is a picture of poverty 
mapped by county in the United States. It lets you know that the metric I showed you before, which is a ratio of household income and electricity costs, is not emphasizing the region in the South because the electricity costs are high. The retail rates there are not that high. It's that the incomes are distressed. And that heat wave in the Southeast hasn't broken in 100 years. This is a picture that shows you the sustained effects of that enduring experience of poverty. The chances that a child born to parents in the bottom 25th percentile will be able to leave it. It's not an equal opportunity experience to be born into that bottom 25th percentile. So it's important for me to bring into this conversation the reality of American demography that helps us think about equity in our time. This is a picture of the residency patterns of African Americans in the United States. Many people outside of the South wouldn't recognize this map if I just handed you a map and asked you with a crayon to shade in. I even heard some hmms in the back just now. It is significant then when you see civil rights organizations like the NAACP move forward to enter the energy and climate change policy discussion with 50 different state-based reports ahead of a national dialogue about a proposed clean power plan, for example. Positioning themselves to support renewable portfolio standards, energy efficiency resource standards, net metering, and also two other policies that you might not have right at the top of your toolkit, but are important to them. Local hiring policies and minority-owned business policies. I think it is significant to think about how a national conversation on energy and climate policy takes into account the experience of the American South and people in struggle there who are seeking to participate in a clean energy economy that unlocks opportunity and doesn't impose undue cumulative burdens where struggle and strife have persisted for so long. Now, I hope that in our time today, we can dialogue about your views on these maps about the American South. But I took it personally during my time of service to think about how to create more channels for investments that would bring the benefits of the clean energy economy to markets where, well, frankly, we were shut out. So my last segment of remarks is about that experience. I'm going to bring you back to the original map from the South that shows the average <coughs> utility bill and the median income focusing in this region here. These are averages. And real statistical experts will be offended that I had to use an average and a median, and it's not exactly precise. The gesture of it is enough, because what it allows us to do is drill in even further to examine with higher resolution what may be happening in the region. Remembering excuse me, that Alabama and Mississippi here are about 3.7%. 3.7% is right in the middle of the new legend that I'm showing you, which delineates the region by utility area. It doesn't include Mississippi and Louisiana and Florida, I regret, in this data set. But the maps will serve our purposes. I learned by studying these maps that the investor-owned utilities actually had customers that were faring better than the Southerners that they didn't serve. That surprised me. It also surprised me that the investor-owned utilities like Southern and Duke in the area had so much part of the territory that they didn't serve. So in the white spaces that you have here, there's a whole other set of utilities. They are operating as electric cooperatives. Electric cooperatives. I'd practically never heard of them. In the 1930s, 9 out of 10 rural residents in the United States didn't have access to modern electricity. In the 20th century, it was one of the calls of our time to answer that challenge by delivering modern electricity services coast to coast. It was a major project coming out of the New Deal. These electric cooperatives 
serve a rural South that is relatively impoverished compared to the urban residents. It also carries with it a larger burden for the infrastructure that it takes to serve sparsely populated areas. I want you to keep your eye on this area up here in the coal fields of Kentucky. The Department of Agriculture in the 1930s used the United States Treasury to finance the expansion of the modern electricity infrastructure. And the way that they did it was buried inside the Department of Agriculture's Rural Development Administration, an electricity program that today still has unsubsidized financing authority of $6 billion a year. Unsubsidized means no credit subsidy is required because the repayment fidelity is so good on this program that there's no need to make up the defaults with an appropriation from Congress. This unsubsidized financing program was then made available to cooperatives that had organized themselves as entities that owned power plants and transmission lines and distribution lines all the way down to an end use customer. And the federal government would provide financing to the generation companies and to the distribution companies for the supply chains that would deliver the benefits of modern electricity across that landscape. Today, these cooperatives are still thriving and intact. There are 40 million Americans that are monopolized by utilities that they own and have a voting right in. Those electric cooperatives cover nearly 3 quarters of the continental US and sell $40 billion of product. It's not an inconsequential segment of the electric power sector, and it's definitely not an inconsequential segment of the political expression around energy and climate policy in the United States. I asked you to keep an eye on this part right here. So I'm going to point it out again. This pink area is the Eastern Kentucky Power Cooperative. They sell power to about half a million people in the coal fields of Kentucky who have very high electricity costs compared to their income. And of course, in the last three or four years, have lost more than 10,000 jobs and fallen into more economic distress than even before. So I took up the challenge of trying to address my answers to the calls of our time to an area where I knew that equity would be a central part of any solution or there wouldn't be a solution. How can we answer the calls of our time for equity, not just for energy, and do so in a way that opens access to opportunity and rapidly scales up investment for clean energy solutions? That's the formulation that I was working with, not the other way around. This map here shows the Appalachian region and the poverty rates that are exceptional in the Eastern Kentucky area. And when I set my attention to it, I found that the authors of the 2010 report on environmental justice and green economy were right. That they had already been architects of their own solutions. That a small community development finance institution in Kentucky had already devised a way to provide debt-free financing to customers that wouldn't qualify for a home loan, that didn't have a credit score to get an, ex an extension of credit, that may not even own a home. It might be renters and be stuck in a split incentive situation where they couldn't invest in the improvements they needed to contain the costs that were eating up their savings. This is the kind of solution that they were already implementing. The House Smart Kentucky program was first piloted for two years and then ultimately approved as a permanent voluntary tariff in the state of Kentucky. They used a pay-as-you-save approach based on intellectual property that had been developed and demonstrated in Kansas, Georgia, in parts of California for a water utility, and now Kentucky. The architects of pay-as-you-save understood that there were reliably cost-effective savings available in economically distressed landscapes where the quality of the housing stock had deteriorated to the extent that you could find very lucrative upgrades, but still no capital to finance them. So they offered debt-free financing 
for cost-effective investments in energy efficiency for all homes and businesses without denying service based on income, credit score, or home ownership. And while this might seem reckless at first, let me remind you, this is the same way we sell electricity. We don't deny electricity service to people on these grounds. But consumer protection laws actually do prevent us from extending unsecured consumer credit to people on those grounds. And so tying the utilities' credit worthiness and their tariff authority to voluntary investment interests of homeowners and businesses allowed us to imagine how a voluntary tariff that assigned cost recovery obligations only to those people who benefited from the investment would be consistent with a libertarian frame of justice that's well accepted in the landscapes you're trying to address. The demonstrated average energy savings for their program was 25%. With cash flow positive results from the start, the only problem was they had less than $5 million for the whole region for half a million customers they could potentially serve. So I set to work looking for energy finance instruments that we might be able to use to connect the juggernaut of the federal government and its own interest in the electric cooperatives and the people who own them to this kind of innovation. This is what I found. Remember this diagram? Do you remember this diagram? Yes. Watch down at the bottom of the line by the meters. No go. I got involved in a process in 2010 and 11 that I came to understand as a federal policy systematically denying financing for solutions on the demand side of the meter. We were willing to finance everything in the supply chain for electric cooperatives except energy efficiency, rooftop solar, small scale wind, geothermal, combined heat and power. No, 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 no. That gave me an opportunity to think about leveling the playing field for technology and business innovators that were basically locked out of a very large market over a very large landscape to actually bring the benefits of the clean energy economy to places, literally geographic territories, that weren't able to benefit. We did that with a program called the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Loan Program that went into effect with a final rule that started in February of this year. We're barely six months into this chapter of American history, where it is now legal for the same federal government that built the grid the first time to come back around with the very same financial instruments that gave us that line to prosperity and allow capital to flow all the way through to the homeowners and businesses that want to participate. What can you actually finance with this program? Anything that improves the energy performance of a business or home that's connected to a nonprofit utility serving a rural area. How much can we finance in a year from this authority? Well, as I told you before, it's actually expanding the scope of application of an existing policy that is authorized at approximately $6 billion a year with no subsidy required. This is the landscape that we were able to address with one policy that made the difference between yes, you can and no, you can't. I'm hopeful that that inspires you to think about the opportunities you have in your own life, to look at the problem frames that you work on, to imagine the dimensions of equity that you could address with it, and to explore when you can what options are available to you to expand the opportunity and to answer the calls of our time, not just from a technology perspective, but from one that actually takes into account the subjective values that are at play whenever we make decisions about the distributions of benefits and burdens in such a large move. This closing slide recaps some of the places that we have visited. And we're right on time for the kind of discussion I've been looking forward to all day. I hope that I have dared to be provocative enough for you to engage me now. So I'll look forward to your questions. But before I give up the mic to John White, who I think is moderating, I want to thank Stanford again for allowing me to be a risk taker as an intellectual, an explorer in an interdisciplinary program, and a person who could come back after a real world experience and share some of the humbling and hard lessons learned. Thank you very much. Thank you.
take a few students first, if that's okay. Sure, yeah. sure. sure. Well, thanks, Hans, for an extremely inspiring and provocative to say the least uh, talk. As there's our normal, well, first of all, I've been asked to remind people there's a map, uh, remember a map? Social right outside for about an hour starting at 5.15. Um, next, uh, we usually uh, give preference to students in this seminar. So do we have any student questions, comments, suggestions? You're already inspired. Students, please, please. Did my best. <laughs> okay, let's. Oh, there's one. Thank, um, you. thank you for a wonderful talk. I was wondering, so you talked about the um, energy landscape in the US. I was wondering whether you've had a chance to look at anything uh, overseas because the same equity issues exist internationally um, with huge fractions of the world population and how we might be able to address those as well, because you know that China and India um, are continuing to grow, emissions continue to rise, and equity hasn't really kept up in either of those countries. And I'm from India, and I've, you know, I've, I've seen some of this. Um, and it's not like you know Africa is developing, and it's not like other countries are trying to really trying hard enough to to shrink their footprints and make things more equal. So I hoping you might be able to shed some light on that. Do you want to take a couple of questions, or uh, why, don't you, why don't you do that one? Because that's sure. a big. That's a well, biggie. Yeah. The, the the direct question is: Have I devoted myself to those challenges? And I'll tell you, I haven't been in a position to play with somebody else's chessboard. And there's a certain amount of humility in my disposition of interest in what's happening in those nation states, but not propriety. But there are people at Stanford who have endeavored to gain the expertise that would give you, I think, much better insight. One thing that I think is important to acknowledge is that one of our three calls to action is accumulation problem. Climate change is a cumulative problem. And so the United States, with its cumulative experience in burning fossil fuels, has an outsized responsibility to act on its, its own investments and its own existing infrastructure. If I could put it more bluntly, I have a lot of work to do here before I get interested in somebody else's situation. I want to acknowledge that Paul Baer uh, here has worked on a rubric for greenhouse development rights that actually qualifies and quantifies the fair attribution or allocation of atmospheric space, so to speak, in equity terms. And the findings of that analysis are arresting. And it convinced me years ago that my best efforts would be spent here, but that's not because I wasn't interested in what people were doing there. Wait, we had one up here in the middle, yellow shirt. Yeah, uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, I guess one of the most effective investments in the Kentucky pilot program in terms of technologies. Um, and then the other thing I was wondering is, well, a, a few of them are not very sophisticated technologies, like sealing up cracks in windows, ceilings, doors, and roofs. But the advancements in heat, cold, cold temperature heat pumps in the last five years and the costs associated with them are probably the most impressive thing to me. The, the heat pump technologies allow us to think about electricity-based heating and cooling in ways that wouldn't have penciled out the same way years before. Back over here. Uh, great presentation. At the beginning, you mentioned uh, how in South Africa the sustainable energies were some of the most cost effective. And I'm wondering what exactly those sustainable energies were. Because of the distances between the territories that had been, as a matter of policy, systematically denied access to electricity and the nearest line to service them, because of those distances, distributed photovoltaics, even at prices much higher than today, were the most cost competitive and effective way for delivering modest services. It wasn't enough to actually run dishwashers and you know dryers, right? And so we actually did run into a tide of disparagement among people who considered our solutions to be second class electricity, and we're not second class people. And that's another really strong equity theme in the experience of providing modest uh, 
distributed generation solutions to territories that know that grid electricity might provide them a higher level of service. I think that's one of the fundamental challenges of using that technology suite. Any more student questions? Sure. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Fantastic. One quick question. How do you convince, how do you approach these people that are often uh, not looking very forward and like part of the future and not probably very educated that they should take these energy efficiencies uh, projects per se? My experience is that people have a tremendous amount of expertise in their own life experience. And that itself is a kind of education that I can't mm -hmm. buy. And so actually having faith that people are serving their own best interests is important, but understanding that they may express very high discount rates, if I can draw that term into our conversation, where a dollar today is worth so much more than, to them than a dollar tomorrow that they just can't imagine putting up their own capital in a scarce amount of savings to you know, be at risk for an investment that may or may not serve them well. That is exactly why the team in Kentucky that used the balance sheet of the utility to finance the upgrades to the houses were so much more successful than going door to door with unsecured consumer credit and trying to convince people that it was in their interest. They actually understood that it was reliable savings enough for them to finance themselves and to use the tariff-based authority of the utility that wouldn't require them to actually persuade anybody to take on a debt. That was the big breakthrough. Great, now let's open it up. Any general questions, uh, John Mashey? Two, three, four. Let's just go around that this way. John, you okay, So, it's a quick question. Have you grown up on a farm? Uh, and, you know, knowing history of rural elect electrification and everything, what's the, uh, the balance in these uh, rural co-ops between distribution of electricity they get from somewhere else versus their own local generation? I mean, what's, their, what's the investment profile in these places? That's a great question. There are about uh, 800 electric cooperatives that are only distribution cooperatives and about 60 that own power plants. Okay. And I don't actually know the, the exact fraction, but it's, it's, it's more than two thirds of the demand for the entire enterprise is served by the 60 cooperatives that do own power or procure power for those distribution companies. Sir, over here. So few electrical cooperatives in California. Yeah, that's an interesting story about the, the, where California was in the 1930s with its own economic development patterns that were highly correlated with the corporate patrons that were investing in the industries of the time, including the trains and the mining, uh, both of which were energy intensive and produced infrastructure that I think had been developed and used for purposes that didn't require collective ownership. Remember, the people who formed cooperatives really had no other option for accessing capital. And that's my best explanation for how California managed to finance its own development without using that tact. But I'm, I'm not a scholar on that, but that's what I think. Let's go here and then back there. So any estimate of how many terawatt hours are involved in this? Out of the 4,000 terawatt hours that the US generates in electricity only each year, what fraction are we affecting? Are you talking about the electric cooperatives? Yes. Well, you know, I think the ratio, uh, the fraction, I believe, is in the 15% range. Uh, it's 15% it's or less. It's not much more than 15%. But I want to point out that the solution that the federal government is demonstrating with this policy innovation that is accompanied by a business innovation and an on-the-ground implementation innovation is transferable to every investor-owned utility in the United States that has plenty of access to low-cost capital through the private sector bond markets. So it's not an isolated solution. It's actually a leadership position that we're demonstrating. Ma'am, actually, the, the one right in front, there's two of you back there. Oh, no, this one. Go ahead. So my understanding of rural electric co-ops is that many of them have long-term power purchase agreements for coal and gas. So what does it take for a utility to actually take advantage of this financing, and what's the incentive to the utility? Let me turn that uh, around to point out that the cooperatives are actually owned by their members. And so the question is, do the members have an interest in access to low-cost financing that helps them diminish 
their energy costs by as much as 25% with cash flow positive savings from the beginning? And if the answer to that is yes, then you have to start thinking about the value of stranded PPAs for power plants that may be burning things you know, that have escalating costs in the future if environmental protections you know, come into force. But I think right now, what we're looking at is essentially a conversation about our opportunity to deliver the benefits of the clean energy economy to the members of cooperatives that have previously been, frankly, locked out. And the cooperatives that own and want to sell generation have plenty of market to serve. There's no reason for them to continue to participate in a lockout. Okay, sir, right next. Correct. I understand that cooperatives typically serve people who have no other energy option, but do you have any data on what the average cooperative customer pays for energy monthly, say, relative to a non-cooperative customer? That's a good question. Um, the figures are not tremendously distinct, let me put it that way. What you saw earlier in the elevated fractions, I was expressing everything as a ratio relative to income, is really an indication more of the distribution of income in the United States than the distribution of energy consumption or costs. Because the cooperatives, by and large, are not selling power that is exorbitantly priced. Uh, let's do two more, three more. Uh, one here, Fran, and then the fellow in the back. Uh, if I'm understanding correctly, the, the essentially loan or the money that has gone to these, these energy efficiency upgrades uh, has such a great payback, uh, then why, why is there no more private interest in, in that sector? Why are there no more bank loans going to similar, uh, similar energy efficiency upgrades? You use the words bank loans. And what I was trying to illustrate was that the tariff-based authority of a utility to actually take onto its own balance sheet the credit risk of their customers, which they do for every other type of service that they sell, is a superior model to trying to indebt your customers with the con consumer loan terms that banks do require and the consumer protections that legitimately accompany that. Current uh, eHyper PhD student, Fran Moore. I, um, I want to kind of talk about, about the um, environmental justice concerns you raised. And here in California, when they were designing the cap and trade program, the environmental justice community took quite a, um, really didn't like it and was quite opposed to the implementation of a cap and trade program. I'm wondering, do you think that there's something fundamental about cap and trade that can't, you know, is kind of flawed from a justice perspective? Or pro pro kind of properly designed, can it address these environmental justice concerns? And if so, what would that design kind of look like? I think that the California case is actually important to study procedurally as well as substantively. The AB 32 law explicitly and expressly set up a process for engaging and uh, responding to concerns that were raised by environmental justice communities in their own dedicated commission. Yet the people who participated in that process felt frustrated at different times about their sense of process or, or due process and ultimately went to court over it, which was a stir and a distraction that didn't dislodge the policy, but it did gain them some negotiating you know, leverage at the table and ultimately re resulted in the passage of SB 535, which guaranteed that a certain fraction of the revenues raised from the cap and trade system would be devoted to disadvantaged communities. And I think, frankly, that's a pretty good model for addressing the equity concerns that may be being raised by people in other states across the United States during the deliberations about how the clean power plan as proposed by the EPA may be implemented on a state by state basis. Last question before party time, way in the back. Sorry. I'm glad you mentioned Kentucky uh, in this example because depending on how the midterm elections go, the next speaker or the next Senate majority leader could hail from that state. Um, and I mentioned that not just out of political coincidence, but because of climate change is often a political issue, as are issues of equity. And for some, that's actually a non-start. So what might be your message to those who have technologically feasible projects that are financially rewarding to make that a political reality, and are at least to get that discussion going, but for whom it's often a non-start? Hmm. I want to just make sure I've understood the, the nature of the question. But because we're short on time, I might check you at the reception and offer an answer for what I thought I understood. 
the, one, no, one minute. The, the, the United States Senate is, in my view, not likely to be able to muster votes to overcome a presidential veto that would derail the president's climate action plan. I think the president is committed to executive action to address the calls of our time. And he has given the Department of Energy, the EPA, and the other cabinet agencies a lot of flexibility to find every instrument we can to be responsive and to show up to history. I think the election and the results will be reflective of America's understanding of that, but maybe not having climate change as a deciding factor for the votes in Kentucky. But my view is that the president and the administration are answering the calls of our time, and the president will defend our actions uh, no matter who ends up in control of the United States Senate. With that, I want to say thank you for Can all of you. Can you one more? Oh. oh. <laughs> I, I missed it. It was my fault. Sure. I didn't see him right sure. Away. Last question. I promise. I, I think the uh, ability of the utilities to use uh, tariff-based financing for a lot of these uh, upgrades is a great thing. So thank you for bringing that up. My question is, is there a risk of what happened in Detroit when the water got shut off for people who couldn't pay for it? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Collections for energy efficiency cost recovery are implemented on the same terms as every other product that the utility sells. The good news is that the energy efficiency investments actually re result in a net reduction in the customer's bills from the very beginning, making it more likely that they will be able to pay their bills instead of less likely. As a result, the family that participates in the program gets a more comfortable more affordable and possibly more valuable home, and their delinquency and default rates are not at risk of rising. Great. Okay, thanks once again. Thank you very, very much. Thanks. Have a good day.